Psalm 87. Psalm 87. A psalm of the sons of Korah. Listen, if your earthly father was a louse and didn't teach you what holiness should look like, didn't teach you what the heavenly father is like, you have no excuse. The sons of Korah, their dad was kind of a louse, right? He was enough of a louse that it's not fair to the other parasites. He was a bad guy. He was so bad that God said, nope, the ground's going to open up and swallow him. And everybody that stayed with him and all of his belongings. You see, God called Avraham out of his father's house. What was his father? His father was into peddling and making idols. According to some old ancient Assyrian, Assyrian writings, his father was actually the high priest of Nimrod before he had to flee to get out of there because Nimrod was going to cut his throat and cut the throats of his sons. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but it adds some interesting thought. But God called Avraham out of his father's house. That means you're not going to take the inheritance that you had. You're not going to get anything from your father. We're going to be relying only on the Lord from here on out, Avraham. Listen, you had a lousy father? You've got the heavenly father. You don't need an earthly father to teach you what truth is, to teach you what it is to be a dad, to teach you what it is to be a grandfather. You had an abusive father or grandfather? So what? You have the heavenly father to teach you. You have the heavenly father who has called you out of your earthly father's house to walk according to the ways of your heavenly father and the sons of Korach when Moshe said, everybody away from Korach, God's going to destroy him. The sons of Korach said, Dad, you're, you're going against God. We cannot be with you. And they stepped away. They stepped away from their inheritance. They stepped away from their family. They stepped away from everything. And what happened? Did God just let them slip quietly into the abyss of history? No. God raised them up to the point where the praises of God that they have written in the Psalms, there's an entire section of them written by the sons of Korach, recorded not just for posterity, but for eternity, people. Do you think we're not going to be singing the Psalms and praising God through the Psalms when we are in his presence? No, these are the most perfect hymns ever written. They were inspired by the Spirit of God. We're going to be singing these. We're going to know what the original tunes were. A psalm of the sons of Korah. A song. His foundation is in the holy mountains. What's he speaking of? Is he speaking of veil? No, that's a ski resort. There's nothing holy about that. He's speaking about Jerusalem. The, his foundation is in the holy mountains, that place on which God rests. It's in the holy mountains. The holy mountain is in the holy mountains. He's speaking of Jerusalem. Adonai loves the gates of Zion. He loves the gates of Zion. How many of us have read Ezekiel 16 where it's speaking of Jerusalem and it's speaking of Jerusalem as being an orphaned child, an orphaned little newborn baby laying there in the dust, still covered with the blood of birth, the umbilical cord not cut off, just laying there to die in the sun and the exposure 
And God says he came along. And he picked up this little baby girl. And he comforted her. And he washed her. And he raised her as his own. He took her into his house. And as she grew, she grew into the most beautiful, the envy of the world. And then what happened? What happened? She started to prostitute herself to other gods. So what did God do? He redeemed her unto himself. He redeemed her unto himself. Now, has that happened yet? The way, the way to redemption has happened, but the act of complete redemption hasn't happened yet. But notice that God, when he had this written all those years ago, uses the term zion. Zion is a special word. It's not speaking of the present tense. It's speaking of what will be when we are in his presence. And the plan of God is completed. When the redemptive story is completed, it's speaking of Jerusalem, not as we see it now, but when the new Jerusalem comes down and it becomes Zion. Wow. But what does he say about you? Does he talk about you as though you're a work in progress? No. He refers to you as a saint, doesn't he? Who in here feels like a saint? Thank you for being honest. Thank you for being in touch with reality. No, none of us feel like a saint. But that's not how God looks at us. The same way he doesn't look at Jerusalem as Jerusalem. He's looking at Jerusalem as Zion. Somebody say hallelujah. Adonai loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. It's special. It's special. Why? Why? I mean, how beautiful are the tents, O Jacob? Right? And doesn't he say that he walks through the camp of Israel? Yeah. In fact, one of the commands is when you have to relieve yourself, go outside the camp and bury it because God walks through the camp and doesn't want to come across your uncleanness. If he's walking through the camp of his people and he finds just being with them so beautiful, what's so special about Jerusalem? Jerusalem is where we go to meet him. Jerusalem is where the temple of God will be. The third temple? No, I don't really... The third temple is there to be a marker in time for us and to be a tool in the hands of the enemy. It's not the temple of God. It's a temple of man. But the fourth temple... The new Jerusalem that God brings down out of heaven? Oh, brothers and sisters, that one, that one is of God. And the mountains are the foundation for the new Jerusalem. That's where the new Jerusalem will be rested. Amen? Amen. And it's coming. And God himself, what do we learn from this? Adonai loves the gates of Zion. He's longing for it too. He's longing for it as more than you can imagine. Glorious things are spoken of you, city of God. Glorious things are spoken about Zion. Then he says, Silah. What does Silah mean? It means stop right there and meditate on it. Think about it. Chew on this. Not just a text.
tagline for a gum commercial. No, chew on this. Think about this. We've got all these idiots trying to meditate and float away and think about all these weird things. Oh, I'm seeing colors. <laughs> okay, great. Maybe we should be meditating on this. Because if we are meditating on the fact that glorious things are spoken of Jerusalem, the city of God, then we will start thinking about what are these glorious things? Well, isn't that where his son came? Isn't that where his son entered in? On the donkey? As the suffering servant of God? Isn't that the place where the Son of God, the King of Kings, is going to come back and that eastern gate is going to melt open? The stones that, what was it, Suleiman the Great? Did he wall up the, the eastern gate? All of those stones are going to melt and bow down in the face and the presence of Yeshua HaMashiach, and he is going to walk in. And it's coming, folks. It's coming. There are... There's a countdown that got turned on in heaven. Okay? I, I like to say that that countdown started in 1967. It started sooner than that. It started sooner than that. The countdown's getting closer every day. We talk about how, hey, we're one Shabbat closer to eternity. We're one Shabbat closer to Messiah's return. You know what? We're a half hour into this service. We're a half hour closer to Messiah's return. You're having a rotten day this week? Lou will attest, I will give him hours, minutes, and seconds till Shabbat starts. The only reason I'm not giving him hours, minutes, and seconds till Yeshua's return is because I don't know the day or the hour. But if I did, I would. I will mention Rahab and Babylon among those who acknowledge me. Was Rahab a Jew? No, she was not. But he says, I will mention Rahab and Babylon among those who acknowledge me. Behold, Philistia and Tyre with Cush. This one was born there. But of Zion it will be said, this one and that one were born in her. You see, what advantage is there in being a Jew? Well, there's a lot of advantage. Does it make us special salvifically? Absolutely not. Except, there's that yet, no, but yes, right? Except salvation came to the Jew first and the Gentile second. And not only that, but the Jew gets the double portion. Why? Because he's the firstborn. So therefore, not only did the salvation come to the Jew first and the Gentile second, but at the end of days, it comes back to the Jew. Amen. But of Zion, it will be said, this one and that one were born in her, and Elion himself will establish her. What's the name Elion mean? Most high. Most high. Most high. That, that, that has nothing to do with contemporary medicinals. It has to do with the spiritual realm. Right? We talk about these people wanting to get high. In the 70s and the 80s, people talked about being high. Oh, it was such a high. Rocky Mountain high. No, 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 no. There is no high like the most high. There is nothing that compares to him. 
He is above all. And it's by him and through him and to him are all things. He is the foundation. Elyon himself will establish her. He's speaking of Jerusalem. Elyon himself will establish Zion. Do you really think, let's just, let's just spitball for a moment, do you really think Iran is going to win in all of this? Yesterday or the night before, some, some, some people, we'll just leave it at that, put a projection up on clock tower in London that scrolled through from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. You know what? Are they going to succeed? No. No, they're not. Because El Yon himself will establish Zion. And if God himself gets involved, can any man stand opposed to him? No, because at the name of Yeshua, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And I know some people who hate him so much that they will not bow their knee and they will refuse to confess until they're in his presence. And that point, his awesome holy presence will throw them to the floor and they will be worshiping, but it will be too late, and that will be the only chance they ever get in eternity to worship him, because after that, they will be facing judgment. Adonai will count in the register of the peoples. This one was born there. Silah. Then singing and dancing, all my fountains of joy are in you. God himself takes joy over Jerusalem. I mentioned last week during the prayer for Jerusalem, the prayer for Israel, that it's not, it's not an option. It's a commandment. Lou and I were talking about this this morning. He's going to talk about that a little bit later. It's a command. We don't have a choice. Who would want a choice? It is only right. It is just to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, to pray for the people of Israel, to pray that the gospel coming back to them, they would get their double portion. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we... Lord, we marvel at your plan. We marvel at all that you have done. We marvel that you will have your will accomplished regardless of what mankind says or does. Lord, help us to be found faithful in you. Father, I pray for your anointing on this service that your spirit would use it Lord, usually we're asking, let it glorify you. And I pray that, yes, but I'm also asking, Lord, let this service be a balm to your people. Our emotions are raw. Our souls are raw. Our spirits are bruised and battered. We're exhausted, Lord. Let this be a balm to them, and may your spirit Fill each one of us and quicken each one of us and strengthen us for just another week. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen.